Good evening, friendos. It's time for Quest for Semi-Glory, a Saturday night grab bag coming your way. We've got a couple bee-themed games uh, to, to go over tonight. Um, the first one here, Hive Time, is still very much in development uh, by a buddy of mine called Cheeseness. Uh, and maybe he'll be stopping by tonight on Voice 2 to kind of... Gonna give us a little walkthrough on what we got going on, but let's just let's dive right into it. It's a it's a, a bee themed uh, base management and simulation game, or, or, or so I've been told. And I did uh, put a couple minutes into it uh, yesterday just to see what was going on, but uh, let's just, just start anew. Let's start anew right now. Uh, there's no sound to it for now. Um, let's add some tunes going on in the background. So uh, let's see what we got going on here. Let's see what we got. Some, got some honeycombs. We got some. Bees just doing some stuff. All right, so we got a whole bunch of resources top right. Looks like we got our population top left. Those the number of squares we got. All right, let's just take a peeksy pokesies here. Let's just take a peeksy pokesies here. Oh, and it looks like we may be visited by Cheeseness himself. My goodness, is 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 Cheeseness online today? Really? I hope I'm online. Yes, you are. You're coming through loud and clear. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing, man? I'm I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I've I've gotten up and I'm I've become human and now I'm ready to be on your stream. Ah, oh, I see. Well, I'm I'm sorry to hear that. The whole uh, gotten up part. That's <laughs> that's kind of rough. Um, but hey, I'm I'm glad you're, you're here. Like, I'm glad you're here. And I'm I'm glad you kind of give me a, a chance to look at this uh, in development build here. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so one question right off the bat, like, why, why bees? Why bees? I know a lot of people don't really, uh, aren't really, uh, particular about bugs in general, and sometimes bees can scare folks a bit. So why bees? I mean, I just, I just kind of generally like bees. I think bees are interesting. They're valuable parts of the, uh, the ecosystem, and they perform in terms of, of, um, you know, produce, they, they perform a lot of valuable services for us humans uh, after we learned to, to farm them. Um, but uh, I also run, with my partner, a little art blog site called Tulof Bees. Um, and uh, so we kind of have a lot of bee-themed things doing, uh, going on. And this, uh, this particular game grew out of a, a little 10-day game jam that, uh, that she and I did together um, in, is it now, it's June, at the end of April? I think we did it at the end of April. That does sound familiar, yeah. Okay, so so when you say your partner, that's uh, Mimnus, right? Yeah. Okay, very good, very good. Do you have tutorials turned off, by the way? Oh, I don't actually know. <laughs> um, hmm. let, me, let me check here. Let me check here. Um, I don't think I specifically... Man, I love that menu off. transition. That's all new. I, I put that in very yeah, recently. Yeah, that's, that's very slick and smooth. I like that. No, I don't I don't have them skipped. So. You don't have skip tutorials on. Maybe I broke them at some point. Oops. Ah, that's all right. So at the beginning, yeah. it's meant to tell you to build an exit, and then it's meant to tell you to build a wax assembler. Wax assembler, uh, Because okay. you, may, you may run out of wax before you... Uh, uh, yeah, no, you could. You could. Uh, okay. All right. So yeah, I, I I I caught into the exit thing pretty early on yesterday when I was testing. But uh, you know, wax assembler. Uh, ah, here we go. Oops. I think I'm already out of stuff to build the wax assembler. Uh, no, you should be good as long as you got an exit. It only costs nectar and pollen. Oh, I see. I okay, uh, see so... that on the right side is like a little pattern of available spaces Oops. that you need. Oh, I didn't want to destroy you... that. That's no, right. Uh, yeah, I get you. I get you. Okay, so, all right, so we got, oh, we're already down, looks like three Bs. Oops. Uh. It's cool. It's cool. I you hope those come back really, at some point. Like, yeah, you can't really back yourself into a corner much with this. It's pretty zen. Okay, yeah, that's good. See, I, I, don't, I don't play a whole lot of, of, of base or, or, or sim management type stuff, so it's, uh, it's a nice change of pace for me, at the very least. I think Patch of Dahlias and everybody is a buzz. Oh, that's adorable. I, I'd love the art style for these little uh, uh, intermediate vignette things. It's great. It's very cute. Yeah, um, uh, Mim did most of those. Um, she did most of the 2D art. Um, she also did the individual rooms for like the um, nursery and the map room and the barracks right. and yeah, the, I get you. Uh, the other workshop.
it was her first time doing anything in 3D, so it was um, it was really cool to uh, to to see those skills grow. And this is using the the Godo engine, is that right? Yeah. Cool. Very cool. You just kind of expand your hive out and get stuff built up, and this is. Uh... Is this where you, how you plan to limit it kind of down, just this next outer ring here, or is it going to eventually turn into something? I oh, know you go as, go as far as you oh, want. Oh my goodness, okay. So if I were Actually, to... there is a limit. You can have a maximum, like the, the grid is, is about 2,000 cells. <laughs> okay. But you can only build on adjacent cells. I, I see, yeah, okay, I get you. Just kind of expand it out there. All right, we're yeah. down to two bees only. Oh, oh, there's a third, okay. So, so you get, get that... Um, Get that wax assembler going. Oh, did I not? And then I'll fill you in on the rest that? of the tutorial stuff. Shoot. Do you have the mouse cursor captured? Oh, I don't. Oops, I'll, I will turn that on so it makes it easier <laughs> to see what's going on. Uh... Oops. Now I've done it. These games, are, these games are kind of tricky in terms of like, what do you convey and how do you convey it? Because there's like, there's something interesting about exploring and working things out on your own. Um, but there are also a bunch of core concepts that you want to make sure you know up, up front so that you're not backing yourself into a corner. Right, right, right. right. It's hard to kind of defend the player from themselves in, in some of these situations too. Especially yeah, if they're yeah. as impatient as I can be sometimes. Right? I want to do everything. Oh, I don't have enough for anything important. So the um, the any of the multi-cell buildings at the moment the middle most cell is the cell that you've got to build on. Oh, I see. Okay, so I, I I hadn't noticed the symbol on the right hand side saying that that's the sort of pattern I needed. Okay, that's why it wasn't going. When that shakes from side in in a future build that will shake from side to side and there'll mm. be a sound when you can't build and that will be a little bit more obvious. But okay. Yeah. Okay, right okay. now <laughs> it does, it's not very high. Yeah, it's like because I was clicked it once or twice. I'm like, why isn't this building? All right. Uh, that makes sense then. Alright, so you've got a you've got a nursery down there on the uh, the mm -hmm. bottom left. Mm -hmm, if you mm -hmm. click on that, population workers, we got okay. a population menu. I get you. And if you have bee sitters, every time a bee sitter is working in a nursery, they will reduce the amount of time till the next bee spawn. Ah. And this is how you grow your population. I get you. All right, so we'll turn up the chance for a bee sitter then. Foragers, I'm guessing, will advance your resources a bit more quickly then? Right, exactly. Okay. Um, the normal bees can harvest at a certain rate, the foragers can harvest a bit faster. Okay, I'll, I'll turn both of those up and see. Oh, that's cool. In my mind, the core of the game is about finding the balances and equilibriums of, of population diversity um, in ways that allow you to accomplish whatever you want. Um, so yeah, population is sort of the next step in the tu tutorial. Uh, some some of the text isn't final, you know, it's just hanging outside <laughs> right. the UI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got it going um, I'm in the middle of, of working on like a research uh, <laughs> um, system where um, it, uh, it, you know, to start with you can only build like six different buildings and I, you know, that way you, you've got that kind of, you know, overwhelming number of choices is a bit more limited. Right, right, right. So and you, and you like actively participate in, in how things get unlocked and what order they get unlocked. Sure. Okay. So, so tell me about the uh, source of this uh, three stink bugs in a trench coat thing. I, I, I don't know. It was just like it's you know. Um, I can't remember which one I did first. Um, but I like the idea of three things in a trench coat. Like I think that's kind of fun. <laughs> Um, and then I was like, what's what's funny in this world? What's interesting in this universe? It's like stink bugs. It's always stink bugs, right? Um, and yeah, three stink bugs in a trench coat. It's like a recurring joke that, uh, that shows up. Like, Miriam hates it, which is awesome. And so every time she's playing and three stink bugs in a trench coat comes up, she's like, why why you put more in? <laughs> well, I love it. It's It's fantastic. Please put more of those in. So the queen lives for a set period of time. If you click the inspect button down the bottom of the screen, it'll it'll sort of pause the game and let oh, you okay. uh, inspect the beast around. Each for the um, queen being regal destination. <laughs> so good. she lives for uh, for two hours, which is uh, was seventy two hundred seconds. Um, there's currently nothing that kind of really tells you that aside from the tutorial that you're not seeing, which is sad. <laughs> um, that, that'll change a little bit in the future, but basically your entire goal is to 
uh, harvest produce uh, uh, what is it um, 600 royal jelly which is the the white droplet icon there uh, which will allow you to make a new queen I got you and if you don't make a new queen before the old queen dies it's game over oh. well that is good to know now I know what to uh, shoot for here Okay, so you can see that the you got two bee sitters working there on your uh, mm -hmm. on your mm -hmm. nursery. There's a maximum of three bee sitters that you can have working a nursery at any given time. Um, same for the exits, maximum of three bees on an exit. Um, so you you kind of might want to build more nurseries. Building more nurseries also increases your population limit, and you'll also find that um, on the on the left hand side there's this extra piece of HUD. Um, showing different symbols for, for different B-rolls, oh, and each B-roll has its own sort of population capacity. You can go over that, but if you go over that, the bees will have uh, a reduced lifespan. I get you. So, so if, if you end up with too many of a particular type of bee, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt you super bad, but you are kind of on borrowed time a little bit. All right. So more nurseries ups my cap for bee-sitters... I haven't quite figured out what... And your entire population cap. Oh, and the entire population. Okay. Oh, yeah, I see. So now it's uh, out of 24 instead of whatever it was before. Yep. Very good. Okay. So the the different resources then top right, I'm guessing I can increase the capacity for that by building something else, too? Yeah, so there's a storage, storage. submenu. Oh, I get you. Okay. Does it matter uh, where I put the kind of storage cells in relation to the exits, as far as how efficiently things are moved around? Um, no, no. Right now, I we, we kind of wanted to keep it fairly simple, because okay. um, there's already enough complex stuff going on, but something that sort of emergently came out was, right now, the bees take the same amount of time to move to any cell, regardless of how far away it is, which means that they will move to a close cell slowly and a distant cell quick. I see. And okay that kind of ends up giving them this sense of, um, you know, maybe they walk to close ones and maybe they fly to far away ones and it, when you've got, you know, 400 bees in your hive, the, the movement that they make is very reminiscent of an actual beehive, you know, seeing bees, uh, a whole, whole colony of bees moving around. I see. It. It's very cool. Okay, yeah, I can definitely see the activity spinning up a little bit here. And I, I, li I like that they kind of drift side to side as they move, it's not just a, a straight line. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that another another happy accident. I just you know you put a noise filter over um, rotation and position, um, and it's just one animation that they play throughout their entire nice. lives. And then I, I flip their wings back when they uh, when they're going short distances. Uh, I'll make like a, a flapping animation at some point for them when they. I don't know, in, ga in games of this style, I always like uh, going over all the flavor text and stuff. It's awesome. Yeah, that was that was a, a big thing for um, for me at least when I was thinking when we were th coming up with the uh, the concept and, and thinking about inspiration and influences. Um, I had just been playing um, Flotilla. I don't know if you've played that. It's a Blendo Games yeah. mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. game that recently got a uh, a big update. Um, and I've played a bit of Adam Zombie Smasher, which is another game by the same developer. Like and they have these kind of they have these kind of vignettes that are meant to be world building story stuff um, in sort of a little cartoony style. And it's it's always weird things that you that that kind of evoke a sense of there being characters that you don't know and, and emotional context that you don't know and, and situations that you don't know. And I was kind of like, I love I love the way that that deepens the world in the way that it suggests more about what's going on and leaves it up to your imagination to imagine the rest. Um, so, uh, yeah, I sort of wanted to draw upon that a little bit, and I think it's working. That certainly fits the style so far from what I've seen, so kudos. So in, uh, yeah, next build's gonna have, uh, like, a research system, and then I think the build after that is gonna have obstacles, so that you can't just build your hive wherever you want. There'll be, there'll be places, zones, where you cannot... Sure, sure, sure. Just to, uh, just to, you know, guide you or, or give you a more interesting texture to the possibility space.
throne zone. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's fantastic. I think that's the most recent bit of graphics to go in. I drew that a few days ago. <laughs> I see the portraits in the background are pretty much the same. That's good. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to get it in, but I had this idea of, um, you know, since, since there's this generational aspect to it, that you're making a new queen and whatever, it would be cool to have a portrait of the old queen go on the wall when you make a new queen. Sure, sure. And, yeah. you, know, you can have like a big... You know, when you pause, you can mouse over that and get their details and stuff. And yeah, I think that could be could be kind of nice. So tell me a little bit about your kind of genesis as a game dev, because I know you've worked on previous stuff, like you did some of the, the work on the Linux version of the Full Throttle remaster. You did uh, some stuff for Hand of Fate 2. Like, what else have you mm -hmm. done that perhaps uh, I'm not aware of, because I'm not oh, very well traveled, but. <laughs> That's a uh, that's that's a long that's a long <laughs> that's a question with a long answer. Well, we got lots um, of time. I, I kind of got started. Um, I guess I guess in the eighties we got our first computer. My family got our first computer, and my dad and I learned to program together by um, oh, nice. copying stuff out of the back of computer mag. And um, yeah, they they were they were usually like you know little game things or interactive things. Um, and by modifying the source code, we could kind of you know, affect what it did and learn a little bit about how everything works. And um, I feel like from then on, uh, I just kind of made stuff for myself or for my friends or for my family, or just like little fun things in the same way that you might, um, you know, paint a picture, picture for a friend or, or write a song for a friend or, or whatever. Um, it was never really like a big focus. It was just, this is a th creative thing that you do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then in the in the nineties, I ended up working on a couple of Half Life mods. Um, one, the main one, was a um, inspired by a game called Thief, um, and it was meant to be a sort of multiplayer. Is is it, its scope was way bigger than any sort of first time dev team could should ever approach. Um, you're very very ambitious. Um, <laughs> We did heaps of stuff, and I'm super proud uh, of the work that we did. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it was going to be... Um, you are going to have two teams. One team would be thieves, and one team would be guards, and the thieves would have to like sneak in and infiltrate the environment and steal stuff or, or break something or, or whatever, or capture someone. Or, um, so it's so sort of thinking about that kind of team... Uh, teams, teams with different roles in the same way that you would, might have in Counter-Strike. Um, but the guards would have this kind of detective um, mechanic where they couldn't raise an alarm or they couldn't attack anybody until they sort of had evidence that someone was was doing something that they shouldn't be doing. Um, and yeah, we, we had this, this idea, we wanted to make it really story focused as well, and story in multiplayer games is difficult to make work, so long before the term episodic was anything that anybody associated with games, uh, we had this idea that we were going to release it in chapters, um, and I wrote uh, like 40,000 words of a, uh, wow. a novelization to go along with it. Um, we did a whole bunch of cutscenes, we did tons of stuff, um, and we never released it because it was never like you know in a solid enough state to release. But because we we're all fairly silly, we we also stuck all of the the bugs that we liked and all the things that were dumb too dumb to to fit in the game uh we stuffed all those into another game called grenade snarks and teleporters <laughs> um and we did release that one and and you know um definitely not the most popular mod by any means but i think we we had some modest amount of downloads and uh we're, we're pretty pretty happy with with how that turned out neat i always like hearing about how people kind of get their start in various industries and shit because uh... <laughs> In in some weird I mean, everybody's ways, everybody's got uh, a different path, right? Yeah, right. In, in in some weird ways, like you said, you'd gotten kind of started with you know early computer stuff, and then you got into mods and stuff. And it's like that's a lot of the same path that I took too, and minus the really early computer stuff. Since I'm <laughs> that's a little bit past my time, at least uh, a little bit past my sentient time. Um, so I did uh, got my start a little bit in modding as well for uh, various uh, PC games at the time. And it's like, well, that's Kind of cool to hear cool. other people get that same story. What kind yeah. of stuff did you work on? Oh, I was, uh, I mostly did mods for Unreal Tournament. Uh, it's a hugely popular FPS game. It's the original Unreal Engine sort of thing. I mm. did a whole lot of you know, small little tweaks to it and did 
And one of the projects I got started on was, you know, way too big for somebody to ever conceivably <laughs> work on, of course. Um, uh, that, oh, guys, I mean, you've got to do that once at yeah, least. Yeah, absolutely, and it's, it never got into a, a really finished state. I think I'd released a beta of it, like, twice, maybe, and then the rest of life happened, and I couldn't really go back to it, so... Um, it's kind of how we ended up with, with Guns vs. Thieves. That's what our, our Thief-inspired multiplayer episodic mm -hmm, thing mm -hmm. was, was called. And and it got to a point where everybody else had like drifted off to focus on exams or, or, or whatever, and I was the only person working on it. And I was like, well, this is definitely too big for me to do on my own, so I just kind of shelved it. But it's a project that I have a lot of love for and kind of want to come back to at some point. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I still have all the old source code for all my old stuff just, just kind of sitting there. I, nice. I think back to it every now and again and go, wow, I really had a, a great time working on all that. I really should go back to it. And then something else always crops up, and it's like, well, okay. It's going to sit for a while still. Um, so yeah, thanks for sharing all that with us. It's That's awesome. It's awesome to hear. No, my pleasure. So you asked what other stuff I've worked on. I <sighs> Helping other developers feel comfortable supporting Linux is a bit of a hobby of mine, so there's like... I don't know, over a hundred shipping titles that I've had some kind oh, of wow. relationship to. Um, and that that ranges from stuff like um, having developers go, oh, hey, can you just check out a Linux build before I ship it live? Or, or actually, like, you know, digging in and helping identify Linux, but uh, like, engine bugs and then working with upstream engine developers to get mm -hmm. those resolved mm -hmm. and that sort of stuff. And then through to, like you mentioned, I've, I've done some actual porting work myself. Um, but yeah, there's it's heaps of <clears throat> heaps of stuff, and I have. I, I guess I'll stick it in chat as, as long as nothing's going to ban me for posting a link. Uh, I don't think so, but if it does, I'll I'll let it. Through. <laughs> not, you're good. Okay, good. Uh, I've 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 made a not very comprehensive list because I'm terrible at keeping notes of um, of those kinds of games where I've just sort of helped out other people. Because um, I I sort of differentiate between <clears throat> games that I have. You know, creative control or creative input into um, from games that are sort of other people's work that I I drop in to help out on. Um, so, so I'm, I'm I'm I guess I am picky, <laughs> but I'm less picky when it comes to like if it's other people's stuff and I believe in them and, and think that their work is worthwhile, then you know, they can I end up working on whatever. Um, when it's my own stuff, um, I don't know if there's a particular flavor or a particular style, but. Um, I do tend to work on things that are a little bit out there or unexpected. Most people go, oh, this bee thing is like a crazy concept. I've never thought of this. And I'm like, well, but, but bees build hives all the time. This is, <laughs> this is obvious to me. Oh, yeah. H hence, hence my first question. is like, why bees? Because that's not something I would typically consider. Um, but she mentioned, you know, a lot of Linux stuff, and I think that's probably the primary reason you and I kind of got to know each other a little bit, because I'm a... Yeah, I think that's how we cross paths. I'm yeah. a big Linux head myself. I'm a big Penguin fan. And hmm. it's always... I always appreciate anybody who ships Linux stuff, and obviously anybody who helps others ship Linux stuff, and it's, it's your big proponent of that, and I appreciate it very much personally. <laughs> oh, cheers. I think there's this thing where, um, if you're, if you're working in an unknown environment, or you're, um... You know, you're, you're approaching a platform that you, you're just not familiar with. The uncertainty factor is, you know, sort of amplifies the sense of risk, um, or, or amplifies any, you know, the sense of scale that any hurdles that you come across mm -hmm. feel like they might have. Because you go, oh, like, you know, is this just the thin end of the wedge, and it's going to get worse from here, or, you know, like you you you, you don't really know, and it, it's it's. It's difficult to approach a new platform, especially when there's no centralized platform vendor that you can go to and say, hey, what the fuck? Why is this API like this? This is dumb. You know, give me some support. <laughs> right. That's, that's harder to get on Linux. Um, and, you know, like ev everything in the free software world, not not everything, most of the free Many software things. world is, is community driven, right? Like it's, it's the community that... Um, yeah, the, the free software movement, in my eyes, is all about removing the distinction between users and developers. Right. So You want to give um, kind of that power a little bit more spread around. Like, make people right, realize right. that they it's, can contribute in a meaningful way, even if it is difficult sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, it's definitely not accessible to anyone, uh, to everyone, but, you know, e anyone has the power to, to, you know, pay a programmer to 
modify a piece of software or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but since it's this community thing, and since, since this idea that the community are the developers, uh, the users are the developers, I guess, um, that it makes sense that users should fill that role of providing vendor level support, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get you. And so that's that's kind of where I come from. I go like, well, I'm a user of the platform, a proponent of the platform. It's kind of my job, I guess, <laughs> to uh, to help other ease other people into um, to being comfortable um, supporting. And I do find that like when people have someone holding their hand or you know, giving them a, a little bit of advice or help, or when they feel like they've got a safety net, and they're um, they're usually a lot more willing and a lot more comfortable embracing the sense of risk that this stuff has. Yeah, certainly. But yeah, as for as for my my own projects, um, my main thing at the moment, like Honeycomb uh, Hive Time, is a bit of a distraction from my main project. My main project is. Uh, a text adventure with analog controls. It has a 3D environment that you cannot see that you use mouse look style uh, camera controls to look around and whatever you're facing I give you a text description of. So it has positional audio, you can hear things move as you turn around um, and the back, because there's a world that you can't see, I can tint the, the background color based on what the average of what you would be seeing if you could see. So when you look up, it might be blue for the sky, and when you look down, it might be green for the grass. Sure, sure. Um, and so it, it kind of plays out like like if, if Mist had like full on being able to look around, um, it kind of like Mist, but your eyes are closed, I guess. Um, so you, you click on a path or click on a door to move to another scene rather than using WASD to move around. Um, it's all about that kind of camera movement stuff. Sure. And, and not um, to steal the title drop for me on this, this is uh, Winter's Wake, is what you're referring yeah, to, right? Yeah, uh, the, the full name is In the Snowy Winter's Wake. In the Snow, okay, I get you. And you had, uh, you had taken because that to the... Because large cumbersome names. Yeah, you had taken that to the Indie Mega Booth in, what, 2018? I think it was? 2017, 2017. I think, yeah. Damn, okay. And the time flies. <laughs> yeah. Like... Uh, and I, I was stunned, right? Like, I was like, I'm going to PAX. PAX is a place where people go to, like, celebrate Call of Duty and Final Fantasy and uh, Fallout and Skyrim. Like, that's... Everybody's there for, like, big-name games uh, and big-name stuff. Sure. And nobody's yeah. going to have any interest in my little game without graphics. Um, and, you know, I, 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 everything I did, I was like, I want to make sure that anybody who's outside my audience doesn't waste my time. Because it's pretty draining when people come up and go, your game looks shit, why are you here? <laughs> um, Whoa. I, I hope <laughs> nobody ever actually so, said that to you. I, I did have a, hear a few people go, text adventures as they uh, walked past. Oh, but they yeah. didn't stop and talk to me, so they didn't waste my time. Okay, very um, good. That's some sort yeah, of Yeah, yeah. So I like, I, I went whole hog. I was like, you know how, I, I assume you've been to some, some of these sorts of events. Oh where, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. You've got hundreds of booths and, um, or, or dozens of booths and, uh, they've all got like big flashy signs with like massive logos and bright colors and everything wants to be as eye catching as possible. I was like, fuck that, I'm going to stick a wall of text on my banner. <laughs> <laughs> and then if people and, stop um, to read the entire wall of text, you know, they're kind of, at least kind of serious about it, right? Well, well I, I was mostly focused on, like, just getting rid of people who weren't open to the idea. I was, my, my whole focus was, like, just make people go away and not bother me. Um, and I, I thought it was just going to be me and two empty chairs for the weekend, but it turns out that people will queue and crowd for a text adventure at an event like this. And I I had, yeah, just, there, there were queues, usually, the whole, all three days, queues, all the time. Uh, I was planning to take a break and, and sort of pace myself and do shifts with a couple of friends, uh, have them relieve me for lunch breaks and stuff, um, but as it was, I ended up needing two and a half people on the booth <laughs> wow. across the entire event anyway. Uh, I, I, didn't get a, I didn't get a break at all, I was, <laughs> I was there from like 9am to 6pm every day um, in the disgustingly loud environment that, um, that these kind of events have. Yeah, I think the last. But yeah, it was super positive. I was I was very blown away. Yeah, the last PAX I was at was uh, 2016, where PAX West over in Seattle, and I want to go back again. I, I'd been to a few before then, but yeah, I can definitely understand 
everything you have you have said about your experience because I've been on the kind of the consumer side of it, like walking around and just being in awe of the just massive scale of everything, which is is good and bad. Uh, like I, I'd look at all the the AAA booths and all that and be like, well, okay, mm. they don't need my attention because I'm not really yeah, there they're... for them. <laughs> Right, exactly, yeah. And and they are so loud and so obnoxious and they have so much presence above everything else. And I'm kind of like, these guys don't even make games. These are just marketing people. <laughs> right, who are, exactly. Who are here, like, who cares? Yeah, so <laughs> any like, any time I was there, I was like always... When you take that attitude. I, I would have been the one to queue up for you know, a couple hours outside a, a booth like yours. Just be like, I want to hear what this person yeah. has to say. I don't want to hear somebody trying to sell me the next Call of Duty or whatever. No, I want to. I want to hear who made the like from the per people who made this stuff. I mean, you already know whether you're going to play the next Call of Duty, right? Yeah, absolutely. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of that kind of property where you or you already know, you already know whether you're going to play the next Elder Scrolls game. You know, like you you already know that. The, no amount of marketing on their part is really going to have a big impact. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but. Uh, but I think the most touching thing for me was was seeing was seeing adults draw their kids in and say, "I used to play games like this when I was your age." Oh, and, that's so sweet. Um, and and to have this kind of it, it was different and it was it was interesting because you know the the first person style controls like either on a gamepad or a mouse or whatever are a little bit more accessible to people who play contemporary games, but the reading and the comprehension and thinking about puzzles and thinking about space uh, is possibly more um, more accessible to people who, or seemed to be more accessible to people who had experience playing text adventures and and um, it was it was really lovely to see younger and older people working together to play the game. So you have people literally like standing side by side, drawing up maps yeah. or, or yeah. helping them navigate. Oh, that's a bunch of people drew maps. Oh, and that's I was, super I was awesome. Like, yes. <laughs> People keep asking me, like, oh, are you going to stick a, a, an in-game map in there? And I'm like, people send me the maps that they draw. I, that would be wrong for me to put an in-game map if I do that. And people stop. You're know, like, if you're engaged enough to, to want to, to record or chronicle or um, communicate your current ideas and perception of the games to yourself as a fu uh, in the future as, as like a player uh, when you're, you're later in the game, then that, that says that you've got a connection to the game that is is kind of rare, I think, these days. Yeah, certainly I agree. I mean, I'm not really one for writing stuff down outside a game either, because um, I believe in technology. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I don't have a, a pad of paper sitting next to me, because usually I want to focus on the game, but I can I can definitely like dig the feeling of having to do that, with the exception so of I was... uh, La Milana 2, which I recently did, which I had to write a whole heck of a lot right, of stuff down, right. right, just by nature of the game. <laughs> Um, but yeah, sorry. It's, it's coming back. But um, I was was cleaning up a room and digging through some boxes and getting rid of some junk I didn't need, and I came across um, this this piece of paper, uh, this piece of lined A4 paper from a, like a, a pad that had been uh, written on, uh, and this must have been from 1990. I don't know, two or three maybe. <laughs> Um, and it was a list of train schedules and cargoes, um, and it was from a game of uh, Railroad, Ty uh, Railroad Tycoon that um, my dad and I had been playing. Um, my mum and my sister had, had gone off on a holiday uh, together to have some time on their own, and my dad and I had like, you know, it was during school holidays, so I was home, and dad had, had was taking a break from work as well, so it was just the two of us. And we played this epic game of Railroad Tycoon <laughs> where we were playing shifts. Like when I was playing, he would sleep, and when I was sleeping, he would play. And we'd leave each other these oh, notes. Like we'd have, we'd have an hour or two of overlap, but we'd leave each other these notes on on what we were doing, expansion plans, and what trains were going where, and what cargoes were needing to go here, and what kind of things were trying to grow where. And um, yeah, I found one of these notes, and I was like, "This is this is an artifact, right? Like this is is." Um, something that has been generated by the experience of playing this game um, that is now in the tangible world and now has some kind of deep meaning to me um, you know t to find that was um, was you know was really moving um, 
and I, I feel like if if somebody has like a an experience that's important to them with Winter's Wake and they've drawn a map and then they come across that 20 years later, um, mm -hmm. that's really powerful. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Um, the 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 fact that uh, that we both kind of have stories about familial involvement with that sort of thing is is pretty incredible to me. Um, kind of the one that stands out to me is that our entire family used to kind of go go together on the classic NES title Final Fantasy, the very the very first one. And mm. the the problem at the time was that the cartridge would lose our game, <laughs> like every every <laughs> couple months or something. So we would get so far, and then we would get reset, and everybody would be mad, and we would just start again. And, I don't know. It's, it's something that always stood out to me. Is like, wow, I, I wish we could have done more more things like that as family. But you know, time being what it was, and you know, it's, it was mostly me and my my other siblings that were more interested in that than the parents. But you know, we got them involved every now and again on it too. And it's like, wow, well, like the the entire cartridge that we had for years and years and years is kind of the the same kind of type of artifact. Like every time I saw, it, it's like, oh yeah, I remember doing that for hours. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think we're less likely to have those kinds of experiences uh, with with contemporary games because uh, everything's digital. There's no mm -hmm, physical mm -hmm. manifestation of the game, um, and and as you say, like everything's technology focused, and, and having having to write down things and having to explore and learn things and and stuff like that. everything's very streamlined in a way that that I think makes you less likely to want to write notes these days. Or, or, you know, record other things otherwise. Right. I mean, we've got a lot, a lot more creative tools, and I think people are, like, ma making fan art is probably a lot more accessible now and a lot more likely to happen now than it would have been, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, so, you know, those are those are interesting artifacts that can come out of... Um, or, 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 like, personal artifacts that come out of playing, playing a game. Um, but that's also not for everyone, you know. I think part of it is <clears throat> kind of due to how difficult it is to build those sorts of systems into the game meaningfully, right? Like, you, you can have a game where you have to track a whole bunch of stuff, and if you don't, if you put a very basic system to track that in the game, but it doesn't actually do anything for you, like, it's, it's one, it's not going to be used, and, and two, it's going to be a waste of time as a dev to kind of put that sort of thing in there, so the option is to either scrap it all together and rely on people to kind of track it themselves outside, or to put the like serious, probably serious development effort into to make it a meaningful thing. I don't know how many devs would really do that. It's this extra yeah, it's... defenders now. Okay, cool. Currently, defenders don't really do anything. Okay. Um, yeah, I remember I built something over here, but I don't remember <laughs> doing it. it. Kind of blacked out for a second. Um, I, I'm not sure how it's going to manifest, um, but the idea is that defenders are, are going to help protect you against uh, against threats. Um, maybe they might be able to play a role in events like Old Bitey, mm -hmm. um, which you'll discover eventually. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, I, but I, I, we had this idea of maybe like you know wasps or or whatever come into your hive and start attacking things, ripping things apart, and. Um, and your defenders need to, to deal with them, but I'm I'm not sure if I necessarily want to go down that road. Um, as I say, this is me taking a break from my main project, and I don't want to get too bogged down. This got, this is the thing about games. It's like the possibility space that any given game uh, resides within is enormous and, and massive. Uh, you know, I mean, pick a game. You could probably spend a few decades, you know, <laughs> growing it and and building it into something. Uh, more grand than it already is, um, but uh, I think I think the the challenge that we face as game designers is working out um, which bits are reasonable to do and which bits are um, are just not necessary. Or, right. Or yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know if we'll have physical wasps appearing in the hive, um, but maybe I, I don't know. I'll, I'll think about it. Well, considering the activity I got going on with twenty eight bees flying around, <laughs> it might be hard to track. Uh, if you have yeah, actually yeah. wasps flying around here, but it'd be an interesting little. Well, this is this is cool and interesting thing. I mean, I don't know how cool and interesting it is. It's interesting to me. Um, wasps do invade beehives, um, and bees respond by basically mobbing them 
and raising their body temperature until they die. Right, yeah. I remember reading about that many, many years ago. That's kind of metal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, that's easy enough to like show and represent within this game, I think. Like That's um yeah. So yeah, I'm thinking when when I add obstacles in, they'll probably be like um, like tree branches coming up out of the uh, out of the green. I get you. So, it's, so you're, you're kind of patterning this off of uh, like a pretty typical beehive where they kind of build it among the trees or something like that. So, rather than yeah, like I think, some I think that makes the most amount of sense. Ground bees or maybe even wasps later on, perhaps you model the the other side of the the equation a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, well, I guess I guess could have rocks and stuff poking up into the hive as well, but I like the idea of having like a branch and then it's kind of cut off about, about hive level and, sure. and like a cross section you get to see like the rings of the trees. That feels interesting. Branches are also round and I think round stuff's probably a good fit for this hexagonal yeah. grid. Easier to kind of manage the mathematics mm, of such, right? Because mm. I can't imagine hex grids are... are like easy to They're understand. They're an adventure, both mentally <laughs> and uh, and visually, right? There are a whole bunch of different approaches, um, and I didn't bother to do any research. I was like, you know, this is just a game jam. We're just spending a few days making a game. I don't really need it to be big or robust. Sure. You know, it's <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much words, all right? The time. Right, right. Um, and so I just went with whatever came into my head. Um, to start with, and that was that um, it should be a, a traditional two-dimensional grid, but every second row is offset. Hmm, yeah, okay, I can um, see that. By by half a, a thing, or whatever. Um, so, uh, it kind of kind of goes, you know, like one, two, three, four, five, well, you can't even see me, but yeah, so it's, <laughs> it's, it is a two-dimensional <laughs> Um, actually, sorry, no, it's not every second column is offset. It's every second cell in the column is is the next one along. Um, so if you're looking at the column, the column takes up, a, like the two-dimensional two grid column takes up two hexagonal columns, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, I get you. So you're really um, mapping this to more of, our, more of an actual Cartesian plane rather than going with something hex-specific, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, which is is easy for some things, but more complex for others. So I've got a um, uh, I've got a second way of mapping them. Each cell knows or has a reference to an adjacent cell or all of its adjacent cells. So I can work, um, I can navigate it uh, as a as a hex grid, um, which is helpful yeah. for things like. Um, Old Bitey, <laughs> again, is our, our friend. You have it. He's a bear. He comes and he whacks your hive every now and again and oh, smashes no. big holes in it. Oh. Um. So, so radially working out how big the hole is going to be is um. Oh. You know, I navigate that as a uh, as a hex stuff. I really like keeping things equal on all sides. So that's going to be it's going to be a mad dash when that happens. I think. I'm not. I'm not sure on the final implementation, but currently, if you've got. If you've got buildings in the cells, then it will just knock those back to empty cells, and if you've mm. got empty cells, it'll destroy those entirely. So you kind of <laughs> um, you have this kind of tiered destruction rather than I just get, everything. I get just... You. Okay, like if it just knocked a, a huge hole like in the densest area I've got, I might have some words for you. I've had some. Uh, he currently destroys up to twenty. Uh, Twenty-five percent of your hive. Oh. So most he can wow. most he can destroy is a quarter. Um, and it's funny when he comes late game and he smashes all your jelly storage, and you're like, Man, <laughs> what the hell am I gonna do now? <laughs> Does he uh, tend to focus on uh, the more like closer to the honey storage because you know, bears like honey and that sort of thing, or is it pretty much uh, random right now? At the moment, it's random. Okay. Yeah. Well, there you go. There's an idea for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's. I think. At least my approach to development is usually to do a quick implementation and try and understand how that fits into the system, and then after I have that knowledge, then think about a final impl implementation. Right. So yeah, yeah. Um, that allows me to to approach my final stuff with some insight um, rather than just kind of expecting that I'll have the best ideas to start with. 
So it's an accelerator. Um, it's not documented anywhere. Uh, but if you hold down shift when you click uh, a build order, you can then just click on another cell to repeat that build order. Oh, interesting. Okay. And that works for destroy. That works for um, you know any of the, the construction options, empty cells, whatever. Also works for info, but that's a little bit less practical. Yeah, I'm sure I eventually will get to a point where that will become necessarily helpful. But for now, it's just piecemeal clicking around until I find the right thing. Yeah, I think I th like the the UI has has again. You know, I, I do temp implementations and then do the final one. So yeah. previously there was just like a, a a window that popped up which has a bunch of buttons on it. Each button is a different building, and then you would click as many times as you want to place that building. Um, and I was always like, that's too fast. You know, I want this to feel like a slow thing that you sure. you slowly work through. Um, and after I put the radial menu in, everyone is going, oh, it's so slow. Like, <laughs> I just want to click and have all the things coming out. And I'm like, well, it is kind of fun to just, you know, spam a whole bunch of buildings and mm -hmm. then watch them all get built. Um, so, uh, so I put that, that kind of repeat command option in. Serious business. A stink fucking clown. <laughs> I love it. It's the best. Good times. Okay. So one thing that I think is interesting and tricky to note, uh, tricky to like identify to start with, um, but become something as you play, you become way more conscious of, mm -hmm. is the sliders that you have for the population represent your your target or your ideal. Um, and if you say, I want 75% bee sitters, um, but you only have bee sitters as 2% of your population, you don't have enough bee sitters currently to allow you to reach that target. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, yeah, so you yeah, kind of have you. to, you have to overcompensate. Well, it's, it makes a bigger difference when you're like talking about anything below fifty percent, um, you yeah, know, because then then you have a statistically lower chance of of, of actually being a beast. So if you pop right. it up to seventy five percent, you'll catch up pretty quick. Um, but just because of the way that that nature, uh, the nature of um, of ratios and and representational diversity, uh, just the nature of the way that works, um, having to overcompensate to reach your goal and then finding the right balance for sustaining that once you hit it, um, I think that's an interesting aspect of, um, of managing the population. How do I get more nectar? <laughs> like I'm, I'm constantly at a nectar shortage here. Do I have need okay, more foragers so, to go out and grab stuff? So, each exit can only handle a maximum of three bees exiting at a time. So you probably need some more exits, okay. um, and more foragers will definitely uh, right, crank that right. up. Okay, good to know. Sorry, not not to to interrupt no, no, your 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 waxing eh, eloquently about uh, other things. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, I'd be here all night. Um, I dig it. <laughs> what was I looking for? Um, but yeah, so when when the research system goes in, then I'm probably gonna look at some like uh, bee efficiency upgrades um, to give you another axis along which you can, um, you know, increase these things. Uh, so at the moment, the only way to get more uh, nectar and more pollen is to make more exits and more forages and, sure. and just expand your hive in that direction. Uh, if you have the ability to spend resources on efficiency upgrades, then with a smaller hive and more efficient bees, you can you know, potentially accomplish the same results. So I like the idea of giving you some flexibility with the um, you know, the, the paths that you take to, to getting what you want. Yeah, so your your population's still climbing. You kind of yeah, things seem to be going pretty well. Yeah, kind of. The bar on the right uh, shows how close you are to being able to afford a new queen. Oh, I see. Okay, I was kind of curious if that was the uh, the death meter or the uh, <laughs> the <laughs> the ability to create a new one. Okay, good, good, good. Um, let's see here. Twenty six. You said what? Seventy seventy two hundred seconds, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I got plenty of time though. Very good. 
all the all the other bees you can you can see what they're carrying when they come out of the hot, uh, out of an exit you know if they've been foraging oh or, interesting um, you okay. can see what they're up to what their destination is and that sort of that's neat i i kind of like the little micromanagement touches too not not, not that it's really terribly useful because you can't individually control them but it's like that sort of level of information has always been very interesting to me <laughs> yeah and that's that's kind of what I wanted um, I had some feedback from someone who was like I don't need to see the bees like they I don't interact with them they don't do anything that's relevant to me can I just turn them off and I was like well you know may maybe I can add an option for that but if we're gonna be honest um, the entire game is a vehicle for watching these They're bees right. do their thing right, right. in my eyes. Um, and I, I dig this sense of like, uh, you know, talking again about influences. Um, I used to play a bunch of the original SimCity on, on the uh, Amiga. Yeah, um, yeah. And I loved the sense of intricacy that it had. You know, it, <laughs> it didn't have the fidelity that a lot of things have. It certainly doesn't have the fidelity that this game has. Um, but there's, there's something interesting, I think, about seeing those little dots move on the road and going, oh, yeah, there must be all these cars driving right. on the road. Right, something is happening down there. Maybe I can't see it perfectly, but something is going on. Right, right. And and that's why all the all the individual buildings are quite busy visually. Um you know, uh, not the storage ones, obviously, but or, or the factories either, I suppose. But um, but you know, the the nurseries and the workshops and whatever, they're all they're all quite quite busy and, and imply a bunch of stuff going on. Uh, and yeah, you can you have all these bees running around and doing things. And I just want to have that sense of of being seeing like a complex system do right. things. And, and also all the um, all the bee names. Uh, are the ones that show up in the the little vignettes when you get those question marks? Mm -hmm. um, if there's if there's a bee of that type available, it'll use that bee's name, so you can go, oh, this is tomorrow. I was just looking at tomorrow. And in is, interesting. No. Okay. So anything that comes up, then is that will that always rep, uh, kind of connect to a bee that's already in your hive, or is, is sometimes it just doesn't line up? Um, if you if you don't have any bees alive, you know <laughs> it'll pick okay. a, a name at random, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> but as long as there's a bee there, it'll use. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I guess t towards the kind of visual density of things, I can see maybe as it gets zoomed out and much busier and all that sort of thing. Oh, cute. Um, that the the kind of the visual fidelity of it would go down. So instead of seeing each individual, like fully rendered bee, it would be a yellow one black dot or something like that but yeah yeah um there is maximum zoom you're not far from it um but at that at that level that you're at like you it's hard to make out um you know individual bees right and there's a right, whole bunch right. moving past each other i don't know i think that's an interesting bit of feedback but i you know to your vision i, I don't think it would make much sense to remove the bees altogether yeah i i would find the game much less enjoyable. It's, it's funny, during development, I did find myself just sitting there and watching the bees move around <laughs> instead of working. <laughs> that's, right. It's a common trap for me to fall into these days. Um, yeah, yeah. But, you know, different people experience things differently, and, and if it's no extra work for me, I'm not averse to the idea of, of hiding them. Right. Even if it's just so that I can go, hey, look, see, it's garbage. I told you it was it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> but, um,. But yeah, I mean, if that's what someone needs, then I don't mind. I, I was talking to someone who had like some kind of insect phobia, and they were saying that like at the beginning of the game, when it's just like twelve uh, or nineteen um, uh, hexagons and a couple of bees moving around, that's fine. Um, but when you get up to the like two hundred bees mark, um, that was like seriously freaking this person out. Oh, okay. Um, so at that level, maybe I, um, I can see that. Yeah, you turn them off could be okay. <clears throat> That's the thing, like, I think about Hand of Fate uh, really opened my eyes to that a little bit. Um, you know, Hand of Fate 1's got the spider. I don't know if you remember. You know, um, I'm embarrassed to say that I don't think I've played Hand of Fate 1 or 2 at all. <gasps> yeah. No, I, I have no, the indie box for good. Hand of Fate 1. I just haven't <laughs> installed it or played it. it. It should go on my list of things to do, otherwise I'm going to forget about it. Um, Something I like about number one is because it doesn't have a lot of narrative focus for the individual challenges, all of the narrative comes from the card chains, and mm, so okay. the, the narrative focus becomes this thing that you experience across many playthroughs, 
you know, like many runs reveal these intertwining and concurrent uh, narrative threads, and I really dig that. Um, but the narrative focus on um, on the individual challenges in the sequel kind of um, displaces that, I guess. It like, overshadows that. Um, but yeah, they're both they're both cool games. I love, I like them both. But um, uh, I don't even remember what I was going to say. Yeah, so the spider. Um, in in Hand of Fate One, there's a spider that just sometimes crawls onto the table, and then crawls away. <laughs> um, I guess it's the dealer spider. Um, but uh, so the game shipped, and everyone's like, oh yeah, we love the spider. The spider's cool. Um, and then it turned out that there are some people who are arachnophobic and had no idea that there was a spider in the game, and you know just lost the shit when um sure, <laughs> when sure, spider sure. on screen unexpectedly and it's a big spider like it's it's bigger than a hand kind of thing you Ooh, know oh okay so something that um, you know, would kind of catch your eye a little bit huh yeah yeah it's it's a big thing uh, and it, and it kind of really only sits in the periphery of the screen but it does it's it's visible when it's there um and so we quickly added in an option to uh, to disable the spider but um yeah you know, i i wouldn't have thought you know it just kind of didn't really cross my mind i knew that i knew that people had you know, significant. Uh, what's what's the best, most diplomatic way to say? I, it? Like I, significant hurdles with regards to this stuff. Like sure, it's, sure, sure, it's sure. legitimate trauma, uh, and 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 subjecting people to trauma is not <laughs> not something that I think it's out <laughs> right. of its game developers I, it, necessarily to do. Yeah, that's it's funny. Like it's it's never something you would ever intend to set out to do. Um, right. Certainly, but I, I think as your audience grows, you kind of become aware of that <clears throat> sort of thing for good or for ill. And it's like, oh, okay, well, let's quickly take care of this. Um, because yeah. it's, it's you know, it's the right thing to do, and it's, you know, it's a, it's a certain level of polish to it, too. Like, oh, okay. Maybe we're uh, having this card game in a place without spiders. Yeah, and, and if, if it, you know, if it was going to take a month's worth of work, um, and the, there wasn't a budget for that, then can totally understand not doing sure, it, right? Sure. But if it's if it's five minutes, then why not? Oh, there is a separate pollen thing. Okay. I'm wondering why that count was so low and the rest of my stuff was so high. I've been neglecting pollen storage. Oh yeah, I think you've only got the one cell on the uh, top left of the throne there. Oh, this one here. Yeah, yeah, okay. <clears throat> so eventually I'm going to make it so that you can click on the storage cells and then see like a graph over time of your, um, your stores. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Which I, I think and hope will, uh, will, you know, make it a bit easier to, to understand the dynamics of how everything's going. I'm also toying with the idea of allowing a, uh, an upgraded storage facility uh, give you an option to set a reserve so that um, production will never make that resource drop below a certain amount, if uh, that makes sense. Okay. Yep, I get you. Sort of you, a... may, you may be finding at the moment that you're running out of pollen. Yeah, yeah, when... yeah, I'm seeing that big old zero up there. So everybody's making wax right now. Um, and you're like, well, I would rather you, you made jelly, but they, they're making all the wax. You can pause individual production, or like you can pause all wax assemblers, or you can pause oh, all honey, okay. um, which can be helpful sometimes. But it, if you're building stuff, it's nice to go, well, I want to make sure that I've reserved at least 12 of each, and that way I've always got, you know, some room to build stuff in at a moment's notice if I need. Wow, you just... Uh, had a whole bunch of bees come out of exits together, and then fill up your, your max out your pollen storage. Oh, gee, oh, now it's down to zero again. Crap, <laughs> I missed it. Um, so <laughs> so fast. So each individual, like each wax assembly, each refinery, <clears throat> do those take bees to 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 man them and, and make them work? Is is that kind of why the yeah, pause yeah. thing is in there? Okay, all right, I get you. Yep. Um, and you'll see them. There's like there are bees manning the honey refineries there. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. There's also an animation that plays when they're they're running, but it's kind of subtle. Let's zoom in and check it out. Oh, the wax assembler doesn't have one. Sorry, the uh, the other two. The refineries. Yeah, so like the level goes up and down. Oh, I see. The, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Ha, <laughs> neat. Just a small touch, and uh, one of those you know complex, uh, not complex. Um, one of those bits of details. If you zoom right in, you go, oh yeah, things are actually happening. 
you know, that, that kind of thing again. Where did all them bees go? It is yeah, sort of mesmerizing if you just kind of unfocus your eyes and just let it yeah. wash over you. But yeah, I've spent the past um, past couple of weeks focusing on um, on the menu, so I haven't really done a lot of gameplay additions or changes lately. Uh, it's all been you know getting that getting that main menu working functionally and and making the transitions look nice. And stuff. Mm -hmm. I think when I was testing this last night, I ran into a couple of spots where some of the dialogues wouldn't go away, and then the menu was still active behind them. Oh. Uh, so I have to see if hmm. I can reproduce that for you and see what triggers it. I think it was around saving yeah, and loading. Hmm. All right, I might. Uh, I'll, I'll have to have a, a hunt around. I thought I'd address that. Um, events can't fire anymore when you're in the middle of a menu transition. That used to be a thing that could happen. Good times. Mm, okay. Um, so I'll uh, I'll need to need to mess with that and see what I can see. Maybe maybe fixing that is what broke the tutorials. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, one thing leads to another, and soon enough, yeah. Yep. That's Made an EA game. Oh, oops. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to come down so hard on the triple A's, but they got the resources for it. <clears throat> yeah. It's kind of sad in my eyes that um, people are way more happy to um, rag on uh, smaller developers for perceived management issues but have no problems with um <laughs> large large multi-million dollar development studios yeah right and it's always whenever i kind of catch myself doing that i'm like ah uh, like what why why would i even think about you know ragging on these small two three four person shops you know it's yeah. like why uh... so like i mentioned before that that winter's wake is my main project and i've been working on that for closing in on five years now which um you know that's <clears throat> that's a that's lot a, of time it's a lot of time um for especially for a game that i thought i could make in a week um <laughs> but uh you know i i the scope of what i was making has changed a little bit you know initially it was just going to be a, a little game jam game and while the the narrative structure is the same um you know there's a lot more detail in uh in the environments and, and in, in in what happens than, than there would have been in that version of the game. Um, but along the way I was like, hey, there's nothing like this out there. I think it makes sense for me to make this engine reusable and um, and write some editor tools that other people could use to make content for it. So, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, it expanded into that kind of thing. And then, you know, partway through development, someone says, hey, do you want to work on Day of the Tentacle? And I'm like, well... I love the game that I'm making, but this is the right decision for me to make. Um, and and in the same way, you know, when when we did this little jam for Hive Time, and it it felt like it was working really well as a game, and wouldn't take a lot of effort to um, to polish up into something um, that that would be sellable. Um, uh, that was the right decision to make because if I can pay my bills, then I can focus more <laughs> can <laughs> focus more time on. Um, on uh, on on making winter's wake so right, right, right. Um, yeah. you know like i think i think it's important for people who are making stuff to be able to take advantage of opportunities that weren't foreseeable at the start of the project and and also to respond to hurdles that weren't foreseeable at the start of the project and and those two things are the things that manifest and appear to be management problems but ultimately what i think they are is people making the best decision at the time that they can with the information that they have available. Um, if I, you know, if I had to do all this again, you know, it really bugs me that my game has taken five years <laughs> to make when uh, when really I, I think it's probably, I, if I could focus on it fully, I'd probably only a couple of years. Right. Um, but if I had to make all those decisions again, I would make them again because... Working on Day of the Tentacle was a good experience, and, and making Hive Time has been a great experience as well, and it's it's been you know a really positive thing to do. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's 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 a tricky. There are tricky waters that we we sail, um, and uh, and yeah, sometimes sometimes the best decision is not 
outwardly visible as the best decision, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I think what you're saying about kind of people giving a pass to big studios is... I don't know if it's necessarily malicious or ignorant or something like that, but I don't I don't think people really think it through. Like, if you know, bad management happens at a big studio, that's way less visible than you know, perceived bad management hadding, happening at a, mm -hmm. at a small studio or an individual, because that really s like, impacts the work super hard. Like, you made the decision to work on yeah. the tentacle, suddenly all your other stuff kind of can't really advance at the same Goes rate, on because... Hold, right? yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's funny, like, bigger studios have more in the way of resources to be able to absorb these kinds of yeah. um, things. Like, if I get sick, everything I work on stops. Um, if I work at a big company, if I get sick, then uh, there are other people to pick up the slack, or mm -hmm. the uh, the workplace may be able to employ some some temporary people to uh, to pick up the slack, you know, like, these are, these are things that can happen. Um, but, but when I'm working on my own, it's, it's much, much less of an option. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. But, um, but yeah, it does, it does bug me a little bit that, you know, these, these big companies, almost all of whom have very visible um, and recognized histories of not treating their employees well or not treating their customers well, you know, it's like along these two axes that... In my opinion, I'm like, if you run your business and you don't look after your employees and you don't look after your customers, then maybe your business shouldn't be running. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right? those are the ones that get a free pass, and I'm like, mm, mm, maybe it shouldn't yeah. work this way. <laughs> not that anybody should get a free pass for not treating oh. their employees well. No, absolutely not. Like small, big, whatever. If that's uh, if that's happening, no, no, don't do it that way. Oh yeah, baby bees are called larvae. No, not grubs, but grubs is a way better word, so I use grubs. <laughs> That's fair. That's <laughs> fair. Have you had, um, like, experts in the field uh, contact you about this at all? Like, say, oh, technically it's this or this and this, or, or, or stuff like that? Um, Beekeepers or, or I have, whomever? I have some people who've done some beekeeping who, who make a note to uh, to comment about how this is not scientifically accurate, <laughs> but... I don't think I present it as being scientifically accurate. Okay, so that all right, me at all. that's good. <laughs> yeah, bees bees don't um bees don't uh, have these kinds of roles, no? and they live for more than ninety seconds. You're, you're telling me that uh, that queen bees don't sit on an actual throne and wear wear a real crown and all that? Come on, my world view yeah. is shattered. The throne has a hole in it for the bees' bum to fit through as well. Like, um... <laughs> it does. <laughs> Hilarious. Good times. But uh, I, I did have someone who was who was offering to help out with game design stuff, and I'm like, hey, you know, I don't I don't really have the budget to bring another person on board, and I sure, don't really sure, want to yeah. ask someone to work for free. And also, I'm kind of having a blast doing it on my own. Um, but they were like, oh, so like actual bees, they sort of have, they go through their roles based on how old they are. Like when they're young, they do this stuff, and when they're middle age, they do this stuff, and when they're old, they do this stuff. So, like you could change your role dynamics to um, to reflect that, you know, more realistically. And I'm like, yeah, but that's a completely different game. If every bee has every role, then you don't like none of these these role fluctuations. Uh, mean anything like every everybody is always going to be always going to be everything you're it's it becomes a numbers thing where like mm -hmm. all you gotta do is just maximize your population rather than think about sure, sure, sure. what percentage of your population needs to be doing what and um and they were very very set on um it needing to uh, to be more realistic and i'm like yeah, no, I'm, I'm good <laughs> you can make your own game um, the more big games there are the happier i am so if you're inspired to make something that's fantastic you're, you're encouraging competition to hive time what are you thinking this is gonna go 
huge. This is gonna be triple A before you know it. <laughs> but yeah, I never, I never understood why people end up being so, um, you know, like as consumers, I don't understand why people end up being so tribal about, you know, what game in a particular genre they like. Like, for me, I like space sims, man. The more space sims, the better. And more, more I play, I'll play X-Wing, I'll play Wing Commander, I'll play, you know, play Everspace. Play Descent, play, um, um, Astrakill, you know, like, man, love them. The more there are, the better. But there are other people who go, like, this Descent game already, you know, the, the what's it? Descent Underground already exists. Why are these people making Overload? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, first of all, it should Don't be the other more? way around. Um, right, I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I definitely hear what you're saying there. Because it's like, I, it, it's so weird to me that people get so up in arms like, Oh, you play Xbox, you play PS4, you play PC, rah, 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 rah. It's like, what, what, is that, what purpose does that serve? being all up against each other for what systems we play on like it mm, i don't know i don't have I mean, a I way i can understand i can understand anybody who um <laughs> um feels that you know maybe the console ecosystem is not very developer friendly well sure or maybe yeah. even not very consumer friendly like i can understand from those kind of perspectives feeling that that some platforms are better than others but yeah the, the whole kind of like um Making an us and then them thing where there doesn't need to be one is is just it's bonkers. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's, <laughs> I I remember years ago, like that was the big thing during like grade school and high school and everything was just like, oh, it's, it's Sega, it's Nintendo, or your PlayStation, or it's like, <sighs> I it it just well, makes me so exhausting. Fancy boxes. So like, who cares? Yeah. You know? Right. It's just so exhausting back I mean, then, and just thinking about it again makes me exhausted yeah. even more. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, my, my attitude is I won't play anything that doesn't come to my platform, so I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to ignore. Yeah, that's, that's I'm fair. happy to ignore things that uh, that are on consoles but not on on PC platforms. You know, I, that's that's not a big deal for me. I'm like, I don't, I mean, what what's what's a game that everyone tells me lots about? Um, I don't know anything Hideo Kojima makes. I like, <laughs> never played anything he made, and everyone's like, oh, he makes these games. I'm like, okay, cool. I, that's fine. He makes them in different spaces from where I exist. So sure. for me, they don't exist at all. Yeah. But I don't need to be angry about. It. Like I, I have differing opinions about Hideo Kojima because it's I, I don't know if you really want to hear it, but um, it, it seems to me like him. It and... does seem like a lot of his work is gratuitous. Yeah. But I don't right? play his stuff, so I don't feel like I'm I have enough skin in the game to make that assertion. Like gr gratuitous, and it's 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 so much of holding up the auteur perspective of like, oh, this guy is. A, is a god because he did yeah, such I'm... and such a thing. It's just like, come, really? Dude, come on, people. Like, do you know how many other people are behind the games that he supposedly is the auteur of? And it's, I don't know, it, it makes me a little Yeah, I, I don't dig the it. kind of auteur perspective of, of stuff. Like, mm -hmm. sure, there are, like, people who are, um, you know, big creative influences on the teams that they work with, but... Um, yeah, to d to deny the people who did the work the um, the opportunity to to feel responsible for their work. That's mm -hmm. um, I think that's irresponsible, like culturally irresponsible. Yeah, it seems to me that the the people with such an outsized influence, sure they get the they get the recognition that yeah, it's definitely their style, but then it doesn't really flow properly to everybody else, and it's I don't know, it's just it's irritating to me for like. At, at some point, I considered mm. getting into you know, professional game dev, and at this point, I'm like, I, I don't think I would have the the spirit to really do it, because it's very, very rough. Um, and it would just kind of crush me to try to do it. And then this kind of stuff keeps happening, and it's, I don't know, it makes me glad for my decision, almost. Yeah. Yeah, I remember I, uh, I went to a, um, like a... <sighs> I don't, I feel like, um, I feel like auteur theory is an interesting lens to view culture through, but I don't think that it makes sense to use that as any kind of persistent categorization of works. 
if that makes sense. Like, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. if you go, what kind of influence did this person right here have over all the things they've ever worked on? Is this... Are there commonalities? Are there, are there um, particular flavors of things that, that they ended up being involved with? And how, how much impact did those have culturally? And, and what influences did they have on other people? And that kind of stuff. Um, but I think that you should be doing that for everyone who worked on a thing, not just one person. Right, yeah. We, uh, we as humans tend to gravitate towards assigning a label to something and then moving on and not thinking about it anymore when generally the only real value that there is in these kinds of labels is to treat them as temporary lenses through which to assess things. You know, something just crossed my mind now that as we're talking about this, that, and the other thing. Would you be interested in uh, coming on a podcast I run as a guest? We talk about games sure, and game sure, design yeah. and all that sort of thing. I don't want to impinge on your time too much, uh, of course. No, for no, sort no of I'm, thing, I'm always happy to talk. Okay, fantastic. I, I love the sound of my voice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Cheesiness, the auteur. <laughs> yeah. Great, great. All right, I'll let no. you know when the next I one's mean, coming like, up. Yeah, I, I got a whole bunch of games on my itch page. Um, there are some games where it's just me and I'm making that entirely myself. Um, or, or um, you know, like, uh, let's say Ribbon the Claw Troll, which is a Hand of Fate 2 mod that I made. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. That's that's stuff that I've all made and expressed myself. Um, and, and then there's games like Spicy Meatball Finds a Way, which is a, a game, a, like a superhero adventure game, in using the Winter's Wake engine, where um, uh, you play as a superhero who gets kind of trapped in a burning building with most of their cool superhero abilities hampered in some way. Um, you know, I, I made that on my own and then commissioned a guy to make some um, some music and audio for it. Uh, you know, I, I kind of... I let let the guy that made the music have uh, you know creative free reign over his interpretation of, of how he thought that it should work, but I'd made the game kind of more or less before he uh, came on board. So I sort of feel like that's me. That's all me, um, more or less. But then I've also worked on, um, say, the away team, where I came on board after its initial release. Um, another writer, Michael Fiel, had done uh, all the writing or most of the writing in the game uh, before I came on board um, and I did a whole bunch of writing for the this kind of expansion scale update we did to it um, but I was al always trying to match that guy's style and, and match the, uh, the stuff that was already there and in that way like you know I can go oh man I, I did did all this stuff I did everything but really I'm standing on the shoulders of, of other people's work and mm -hmm, it, it doesn't make mm -hmm. sense for me to to in any way suggest that they didn't have at least as much input as I did. I mean, they had more, because they set the direction initially, and <laughs> I'm just following them. Right, right, right. And I, mean, I think that's how it works with this bigger scale stuff. Like, um, you know, uh, your, your people that you traditionally recognize as auteurs are usually following stuff that's in inspiration that they get from concept artists and, and stuff, and... Uh, and and from prototyping that everyone is, you know, more people are involved in, and, and it's not just one person working in a vacuum, it's it's everyone working together. How did all them bees go? Yeah, every now and again I notice like there's almost a mass level extinction event going on where it just drops by half. I'm guessing that's because they all kind of came about at the same time and then they're all hitting end of life around the same time? Um, sometimes you can get events that um, change your population distribution and usually those are the things that uh, um, okay. that have an impact on that. Because there's, there's a bit of jitter. Some of them live longer than others and some of them you know, uh, don't. Um, and then they spawn at a set rate. So... Um, yeah, there's there's usually usually you don't see like big uh, extinctions unless um, you've got like big extinctions at a similar time unless you've got um, more bees that are above your um, your population capacity for their role. I see. Okay. Great. 
but yeah, there are, there are events that change the the role of bees. Are like they go, oh yeah, seventy five percent of your hive has decided to become foragers because there's a like a Beatles concert playing outside. Um, <laughs> uh, Beatles B E T L E S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. nice. <laughs> it's real good. Um, and so those kinds of things will um will will usually result in sort of mass, mass extinction events when when all these bees hit that kind of threshold of, of being over half the uh, half the age um, but yeah normally normally you don't see a lot of uh, mass extinction stuff going on you, you've hit your population cap there so you seem pretty good jeez I just built like four more nurseries what the heck I, know, right? I, I look away for a second and then suddenly <laughs> So I think I think this is where um, you know, like an upgrade system where you can um, upgrade your nurseries and stuff, uh, will uh, will make you know I'll make it so that upgraded nurseries give you a much greater um, population cap and so sure, sure, sure. you know rapid expansion won't be the only path to uh, to growing your population. Right, yeah, now this is starting to look like an RTS to me. Like you have the cluster of you know supply depots yeah, or whatever, yeah. and then everything else kind of going on patchwork uh, we require more vesping yeah, <laughs> right <laughs> so we talked about like influences about bees and, and stuff like that but there, have there been other like management and building sims that you've pulled from uh, besides sim city i think we mentioned this before earlier too um yeah yeah uh so so sim city is the main one that specifically for that kind of sense of, of an intricate world that's mm -hmm. a little bit mm -hmm. more detailed than your ability to, to like specifically discern into relevant information. Um, and I, I like that sense of like when you build a zone, you're only building the zone, you don't know what buildings are going to end up there. And sure, you see them yeah, yeah. Like houses or, or big houses or condos or slums and you, like that's, that's stuff that happens and you're, you just watch it and you're kind of like, hmm, interesting. Um, yeah, be beyond that, I don't think there's been a lot of, um, of base builder type stuff or, or um, management sims that I really specifically have been thinking about. I mean, I've, I've played a lot of stuff, you know, I've played a lot of StarCraft, I've played a lot of Dungeon Keeper, and um, played a lot of uh, uh, Railroad Tycoon and Transport Tycoon. Um, I even played a lot of um, Space Base DF9, which... Um, I won't say that it necessarily had any influence here, but um, thinking about the things that I like about Space Base DF9, and there's a lot that I do like about Space Base DF9, um, um, you know, thinking about why I like them, um, why, you know, why I like that game and what I like about that game, um, and some of it's like the irreverence and the sense of humor, I guess, maybe that's, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's an influence there. But um, yeah, yeah, it's 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 interesting. But I'm, I can't think of, of any any sort of like you know direct influences. Um, mostly we were just like, how can we make something that feels fairly simple, um, but gives the sense of emergent complexity? And uh, and yeah, most most of that kind of came out of us, um, at least consciously. Who knows what kind of unconscious influences? There sure. Are. Yeah. Yeah. How much jelly do I need? 600? To get 600, yeah. Good lord. Alright, well, hmm. Well, once you get uh, once you get enough storage, I mean, you, you maxed out your storage, you can probably build a whole bunch of storage facilities now. Once you uh, once you get all your storage up, like, it's, uh, it doesn't actually take that long to... To actually to produce the stuff? Huh. Huh. And there are some events that, that give you jelly as well. Oh, if you have builders, you don't have any builders, but if you have builders, they build stuff faster. Oh, I see. Okay. I don't think I can keep up with what's going on already. Builders, <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, it's already, it already too fast. fast enough. <laughs> Where's the buzz awakens? Oh, man. <laughs> see, yeah, I got, like, a big list of movie puns and TV show puns and... And like just all these kind of substitutions that just get randomly filled in. And how many of those do you uh, run by Mim before it goes in? Uh, most of them. I do. <laughs> I do kind of make sure that I've, you know, slip a couple of stink bugs in uh, wherever I can. But 
But yeah, making games isn't sort of Mim's um, main gig, so uh, after the jam, uh, I think she's sort of stepped back a bit um, from development and, and I've been been taking it from there. Man, I, lo I love it when you've got like this big row of stuff and all the bees can yeah, move up. Yeah, that was and, uh, very cool to see. It like, looks great. Whoosh. Look at him go. I'm, yeah, I'm kind of hoping very for nice. the first uh, audio stuff you put in there, you kind of slip like Flight of the Valkyries in there or something like that. <laughs> I think it'd be a good I, uh, I actually bought a Composer on board um, a little while back. Uh, they're they're uh, focusing on other projects at the moment, but uh, we're planning to to make Hive Time focus towards the end of this month. Nice. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to. I, I've known the guy for for a few years, but never really worked with him before. Um, but yeah, looking forward to to seeing how that kind of comes together. I probably won't put any temp tracks in. Um, might put some work in progress stuff in, depending upon how uh, how it all comes together. But um, yeah, we probably won't see any flying Valkyrie sound. Ah, uh, darn. Oh well, I'll just pull it up and play it while I'm <laughs> doing this. Yeah, stuff. yeah. You, you can play. You can put that and fly to the bumblebees in a, a playlist <laughs> together. And... Well, cool. Yeah. I I appreciate you taking the time to kind of hang out for a bit while we go over this stuff. I don't want to occupy you for too long. So if you need to step out and and do whatever, feel free. No worries, it's, it's so good I haven't actually got anything planned this morning, so I was going to have a bit, of, a bit of time off to uh, relax and rest and not um, not have my head down in development too long. It's important to uh, take a bit of time on the weekend and in the evenings to uh, make sure I'm not working all the time. Right, yeah, I hear you. I have a, uh, a strong workaholic tendencies that I need to consciously manage so um yeah having having breaks is always always seen as a positive thing in my life i just saw all the honey storage go down at once it makes me worried that something bad happened was there an event i was like totally i don't i don't think so something. I don't know. Maybe like something all got built at once. Uh, I can't tell. Uh, they they use honey to make jelly, so. <laughs> oh, um, okay. I can see. Let's see that then. Could be that that was happening. Yeah, soon I'm gonna have some um, some more sort of feedback on that kind of stuff. Um, I'll put some particle effects in when uh, resources are gained, and I'll make like numbers drop off the HUD or something when resources are used, mm -hmm. or, you know, that, that kind of stuff, just to help make it a bit clearer uh, when things are going and, and where they So the production is prioritized by um, which resource has proportionally the, um, the least amount of uh, least amount of stock. So if you have five wax and a capacity of 50, then wax will be prioritized over honey if you have a hundred honey and hundred and twenty uh, capacity. And like as a as a kind of default sort of um, uh, way for it to manage itself, I think that's fine. I'm thinking of making it so that you can upgrade your production facilities, and if you do, then you can manually set the priority. Okay. Yeah, that would have been my next question. Is like how much. How much micromanagement are you angling to put into this? Because I can see myself getting lost in this, and I'd, I'd probably encourage you not to do so much of that. Then. Yeah, I, th I think it would be like you, 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 uh, like reorder them in in like a, a list um, rather than you having to like individually click on things and, and yeah, stuff like more, more of a kind of like adjust some sliders, see how it looks, um, sim similar to the population thing. But uh, yeah, I've seen a lot of a lot of people respond not very positively to running out of resources at this level of the game. They're like, I just want to stockpile my stuff, and it's it's like I use all my you know I can't build anything because all production is is using up all my resources. Right, and it's really yeah. frustrating. And so I think yeah, having the reserve feature that I was talking about earlier, and the um oh yeah, there you go. Everyone's oh, going to okay. turn into builders Jeez. now. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Time to build stuff, quick! 
Like, they just <laughs> build a whole bunch of empty stuff. No. I need y'all to be going out and get probably nectar. build a few jelly storage. Uh, oh, you don't have much nectar, hey? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, look, they're all dying, like, <sighs> dropping like flies now. Brown. <laughs> So yeah, I want I wanted the game to be about finding these kind of population balances to accomplish your goals, um, and then I wanted to have these events that just kind of give you the middle finger and, yeah. and rock the boat, and, turn everything and on its, its head, and with... now suddenly I'm down to <laughs> one third population. Yeah, yeah, but I, I I like that idea of of like encouraging you to to kind of go well, you know, I I need to have maybe I need to have a buffer here to mm-hmm. to con- mm-hmm. to account for this or. Well, when it happens, maybe you go, oh, shit, I'm going to build a whole bunch more workshops so that those bees aren't going to die unnecessarily. Or, or maybe I'm going to build a whole lot of stuff so that um, they're, uh, they're, they're going to be useful while they're alive. You know, that, that right. kind of thing. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Just give you something to respond to and, and something to, uh, to just kind of upset those balances and, so that you can work again to, to recover them. God, as soon as I see that nectar count tick up, it then just goes empty again. Yeah, because they like turned around and used it all yeah. for me. Yeah, used Not it sure. underneath my mouse click to build something else. Yeah. So you can pause honey production, um, and you can pause like jelly production as well. You can, you can pause all that stuff and then do your building and then unpause it. Um, but that does end up being like a lot of micromanagement, right. and that's why yeah, I'm thinking yeah. about other strategies for um, okay, for so making that. Now I'm at the jelly disruptive. cap, so honey will top out, and then I can get some nectar to do some things here. <laughs> um, you can also build more, um, more. Uh, uh, what am I saying? Map rooms and exits, and um, and get more foragers out. Foragers. Oh yeah, I um, have the cap for that. Dang it. You're also pretty close to your population cap, so you probably oh, need some more nursery. Jeez, so much. <laughs> it's interesting. Like, it, um, in my mind, I'm like, yeah, it's kind of relaxed, kind of zen game. Do do things at your own pace. It's all good. Um, but it's very easy to fall into this thing of of feeling pressure to expand when you hit your caps. Um, you don't have to. You can just leave it. Whatever. Right. It's all good. But um, yeah, but, then but it's, uh, yeah. But, yeah. yeah at the cap, then you're not doing anything, and you're wasting time, and then... Da, da, da. <laughs> yeah, which I, I think, again, like, having a research op- options will, um, will hopefully... There you go, you're at your cap again. <laughs> ah, man. Oh, man. Right. Um, having, having the research options will give you other ways to, um, to, to accomplish some of those efficiency goals without focusing on expansion. Yeah. But all up, I think the game's like, um, you know, it's it's coming together and it's feeling pretty. So you could you could maybe turn your bee sitters down a little bit. Oh right, uh, yeah, if you want. Always trying to keep that in balance <laughs> Cause, too. Because most of them are bee sitters, right? You yeah, got eighty-six bee. Yeah. 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 We're gonna have to do that. There we go. So, like, what is what is kind of your end game goal for this? Then, like, you you said this was a distraction for your for your main thing, but like, do you foresee? Uh, building this out to something more significant or or what, what's your plan um in terms of scale like i'm kind of digging what it is right now and i think it could be like um you know n- nothing set in stone at this point but i'm thinking it could be like a nice little five dollar game kind of thing um but uh but there are a few things like that like a lot of the ui feedback i was talking about a few more systems um you know i, w- I want to make the the defenders actually do something Oh, I love this one. <laughs> All right, so there goes 30 jelly, which is fine because I'm not keeping up with capacity on that, anyways. Oh, there you go. They just decided to turn all your honey into jelly. Oh, yeah, rip honey. Okay. It's fine. I I just love this idea of a um, you know, what 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 could want to be a ballerina that's like super impractical? <laughs> it's like a cat. Well, it just has too many feet. Too many feet. It's not a... K 
caterpillar, a centipede, or a millipede I can see as well being yeah, kind of yeah. the next level of those. So some of these some of these events have um like narrative continuation. <laughs> the pollen is right. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, like, I feel, you know, the bees don't live long, right? Like, they only live 90 seconds, but... Right. But if you get a chance to go, oh, you know, this this bee has dreams of, of um, you know, starting a farm somewhere, then, you know, if you see that bee again, you'll be like, oh, yeah, that's that bee. wonder how they're doing. Oh, they're dead now. <laughs> um, you know... <laughs> Uh, I, that, that's not the desired thing, but, but the idea, hopefully, is that, that you'll kind of maybe imagine slight, you know, something, something else, something extra on top of, of what I'm telling you for, for all these little bees. Right, yeah, yeah. Oh, I am at maximum zoom now. How far does this go in one direction here? I'm gonna lose my hive. Uh, I, I currently going. don't limit the camera. Oh, okay. If you need to get back, if you get lost, you can just press home on the keyboard and it'll, huh. it'll take you back. That's nice. All right. Um, but yeah, I do need to lock the camera at the edge of the. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I won't <laughs> tempt fate by just keeping on going and then forgetting about home. Just crank off into next week. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking about doing some like adjacency bonus for um, I, I don't know if you build your honey refinery next to pollen and nectar, then oh, maybe I see. Yeah. It, it makes more stuff or something. I don't, I don't know, but eh, I, I feel like it's it's like that's an extra layer of complexity that I would a need to communicate to players and b is like not feeling like it's needed at this point. Right. Yeah. It's like the whole bee travel thing from when we were talking about earlier. It's like it, if mm. it is exits like. D distance to an exit is that a factor in you know how much they bring back or how long they, how much they can bring back before they and, die or something. And I like was that. initially planning to make distance a thing, but then I was like, you know, it doesn't need it. It um, it kind of yeah. Look at this movement. This one. Yeah, it's great. I don't know if you've ever like looked at an actual beehive and seen bees um, moving around doing this stuff. Um, at a distance. Um, it has at this a distance. kind of feel to it. Yeah, I, I I tend to uh, leave them to their own thing and hope that they leave that they leave me to mine. <laughs> yeah, as, as long as you don't piss them off, they're fine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's just sometimes it's easy <laughs> to accidentally piss them off. And okay, that's the I see what you're talking <laughs> well, here about. Here we go. Continuity here. Oh, nice. Ah, oh, dang it, my capacity was so low because I've never been able to fill it up. Uh, well, there you go. Now, now it's all full. You could build a whole bunch of stuff. And now it's all gone. Yeah. <laughs> easy come, easy go. Yeah. But yeah, I like that idea of like, you give up some of your jelly, you get something back in return. Does that event ever fail to to bring anything in return? Is it just kind of like a wa wasted no, investment? That, that 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 one's guaranteed. Oh, okay. Probably want to crank that jelly storage up. Yeah, and capacity be capacity here. Uh, oh, I can't because I'm on an actor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I currently don't have any indication of when your exits are over. Like when you're, you're you've got too many foragers trying to go out, or too many workers sure, trying to sure, go sure. out for your uh, for your exits. So that's a piece of feedback I want to get in there. Yeah, even um, just a, like a count of how many of each thing I've got would be probably helpful. Yeah, I could do yeah. Three times whatever, and and figure it out myself. Let's see. Yeah, that's something I want to want to stick into the thing. So, um, each I think each map room gives you two 
uh, plus two capacity for forages, so you can work out how many map rooms you've got, but there's nothing for But yeah, that, that kind of like building a whole bunch of stuff at once is is kind of fun, right? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I can understand why people were grumpy when I took it away. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it'd be a whole bunch of clicking around if you didn't tell me about the whole shift click thing, so. Yeah. It'll get kind of lopsided here, too. I'll fix that later. See, so yeah, when there are obstacles in, I think it'll. It'll probably annoy some people that it's harder to maintain like perfect <laughs> symmetry and stuff but I think yeah it might actually more... be easier because then you've got a reason for it not being you know, perfectly right, symmetrical right. It'll, it frees you from that right right yeah of course that may just be me no i think most people build stuff so, some some because I've, I've i've given out keys to like about i don't know 60 people are kind of testing this ish um and i found that um uh, found that most people um, are doing symmetry stuff, but there are some people who are like, "No, I want to. I want to draw an intricate picture with my hive." Huh. Okay, I can see that too. Yeah, and I'm like, "That's cool." In fact, like, kind of tempted to just give you an infinite resources mode where you just draw your hive, and make whatever <laughs> you want. If I were planning ahead on this, I'd, I'd want to see more probably just total cross hive movement, so I'd stick, you know, exits more spread yeah, out than yeah. more clustered. Um, yeah, you can always stick some exits on the other side. Yeah, and that's sometimes. true. Then I break up this nice solid white I got going on. And <laughs> weird, weird mental things happen with uh, yeah, these no, sorts of games. People love patterns. And, mm -hmm. um, and yeah. Yeah, I'm just super happy with how this, like the look and feel of this game came out. I'm, like really... It's certainly really very great. distinctive. Like, of course, I don't really see a whole lot of hex grid based stuff out there besides like you know, serious RTS. I don't even know if like Warhammer or anything like that uses. Is it Warhammer that's hex grid? I feel like there's like a one of the major games like that uses a hex grid. I can't remember which one it is now. Uh, oh. Ah, oh, nice. Okay, I think I think I'm back now. Yeah, yeah. I just had to drop out and reconnect myself. I think Discord had a little blip. Like up. But yeah, I think I I think I missed the the last thing you were saying. Oh, the the visual distinction. Uh, the, the hex grid stands out the most, obviously, because it's just the primary shape of this. But I, I was mm. kind of ruminating on which other major games used a hex grid, and I think I came up with Warhammer, but I'm not even 100 percent sure that that's right. <clears throat> I used to play a lot of a game called uh, Battle Isle. Okay, yeah, I've heard of that one. Turn-based strategy uh, that uses hex grid. I feel like I feel like hex grids are fairly common in turn-based strategies. I guess because they give you more options than just a uh, right. Yeah, it's six adjacent sure. instead of four directly adjacent, right? Yeah, yeah, you're back. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> it's like I can see you talking on the stream, but I can't hear you.
How old is your queen now, by the way? I don't know. That's a good question. 57 hundo. Okay. Okay. I think we're probably on track to be okay, considering how much jelly is rolling in, but... <laughs> well, if you can if you can increase your jelly storage quickly, um, that would probably be in your best interest. Like, not necessarily getting more jelly, just getting the storage up. Right, right, right. It's always out of nectar. Yeah, if you if you pause jelly production, um, it'll probably um, is that make the thing that... that directly takes it in. Uh, well, honey production takes it in, okay. but you kind of need honey yeah, uh, at this for point. Everything. Okay, let's do that. Um, let's wax see. production also eats nectar and pollen. Like everything okay. eats nectar and pollen, or eats something that eats nectar and pollen. So it kind of adds up. There's a lot of pressure on those resources. Yeah, okay. Let's see it kind of starting to trend upward. You know what? Yeah. Let's do that. Or is that... Oh, that pauses all of them. Okay. I thought it was a one-by-one yeah, type yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, All right. Yeah, that's even better, actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I was saying. Like, in terms of the, the micromanagement that I let you do, I want it to feel like it's it's not having to... T like, not having to dress every bee. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Switch those as 10... But yeah, this this is definitely a situation where that reserve mechanic would um, would make all this a bit smooth, a bit more smooth. But yeah, it's always always interesting to like look at players' experiences and, and think about the best ways to address, um, you know, uh, less positive experiences that mm -hmm. they're having, or, mm -hmm. or, or or even make the call on whether or not those less positive experiences are actually a bad thing. Because sometimes, you know, um, it's the thing if you don't if you don't experience the. Uh, the the problem of, of running out of resources you'll never feel like it's a good thing when you overcome that right right you won't kind of be driven to overcome that on your own other than you know turning off the game <laughs> <laughs> right right um so yeah it's it's interesting and and you know like with the um like with the the radio menu thing and that slowing down construction a lot um you know, there's definitely a specific experience I would like to guide people towards having where um, um, it's a, uh, um, what am I saying? You know, it, it, to, to frame it as a slower experience in general, um, but uh, to limit it to that, you know, like player feedback led me to, to add that accelerator shortcut and I think the game's stronger for it. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, sometimes that, that's like super useful other times less so so it's always always interesting to balance that and and thinking about things like the away team where I, I came on board for a game that was was already finished and and like how to start to think about how do we how do we um how do we uh elevate what's already there you know like how do we how do we make this the strongest version of this game that it could be um, and in that case, we had we had a lot of feedback um, from players that they didn't like a particular mechanic, which was the um, that the real time sections use food in real time. Um, huh. okay. And I think the biggest problem there was that there was no feedback about that happening at all until you um, until you you know looked away and then looked back and suddenly all your dudes are starving to death and you're like that's a negative experience you haven't had the chance to brace yourself for starvation before it's a problem you're just hit by it unexpectedly right and go, wow yeah, yeah. that's a really dumb mechanic um in in the updated version i put a lot of effort into giving more feedback on that and and making it a bit more clear that um that food continues to tick down when you're just sitting there picking your nose uh and since adding that, 
you know, we, we had a lot of very strong feedback that, that people thought, you know, in the same way that people get very strong with their feedback about Cactus and the battery mechanic. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, in, in this case, after putting that feedback in and making it a bit more clear to players before they encountered um, the, uh, you know, before they encountered the, the unpleasant experience, they were far better equipped to embrace it as a, um, uh, a more acceptable aspect of the game. And uh, another thing was that the the space exploration sequences, these real time experience sequences, were, were sort of not interesting. Um, and uh, the the thing was that you already knew where the planets were, and you could just go straight to them. Mm-hmm. And that's boring, right? You don't make any decisions there. Um, so I was like, hide the planets, and that was good in that you had the sense of exploration. Uh, you move around uh, and find where the planets are, and then you go to them, and then you go to the next place. But um, Everybody was just doing the same counterclockwise spiral outwards search pattern till they found all the buildings and they moved on. And I'm like, well, you're not making any interesting decisions there. Um, you know, it's it, it's better than it was, but it's boring. Um, how do we how do we address this? Um, I spent a lot of time, you know, thinking about it, and mulling it over, and eventually I came up with this idea of we'll add some um, some slow zones, like add some asteroid fields that make you move at half speed. Then it's they don't block you entirely. You still do whatever you want to do, but um, suddenly people were starting doing their counterclockwise search pattern, and then they hit some asteroids, and they're like, "Whoa, maybe I'll just skirt around and see how big this is before I go in and stuff." And and um, because because that costs you fuel, because it costs you food, um, you know, you've got these the possibility space uh, the yeah the possibility space for your decisions is suddenly textured where it was previously flat, and. Um, and yeah, that kind of stuff I find really interesting, and that's that's why I'm motivated to put things in like like zones that you can't build on. You know, those tree branches mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I was talking about earlier. Like, um, I think that that will make the process of of building out your base a little bit more interesting. Um, not not that it isn't fun to build like a completely symmetrical hexagon and um, and that sort of stuff, but I think that um, you're not you're not making any choices when you're doing that, you're not doing anything interesting, or you're not doing anything that you specifically find interesting. Yeah, that's that's true. I need to balance this out anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like, there's nothing stopping you from building symmetrical hexagons in open spaces, but I think that having some some obstacles here and there... Sure. To, um, to yeah, yeah, and even, balance it out. like, something to shoot for on the... Like, not just avoiding something, but kind of building towards the... I don't even know, like, some, right, right. some more resources somewhere else, like, you, like that would give me a purpose yeah. to build on this infinite plane. Like, infinite plane, it doesn't really give me the motivation to do anything really special other than a, right. a symmetrical hexagon. That's that flat kind of possibility space mm-hmm. uh, that I was, I was talking about earlier. But uh, on, on that note, um, I haven't, haven't really kind of decided how it's going to manifest, but I do like the idea of having what I've been calling uh, triple letter scores where there'll be a tile somewhere uh, or, or a particular location where if you build a particular type of building on it, it'll have a bonus. I get you. So maybe, okay. maybe you build an exit on it, you get more resources. Maybe you build uh, honey storage on it, you get more storage or, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, like make that visible a little bit beyond your buildable area uh, and that would give you something to, um, to build towards and take advantage of. <laughs> yeah, you're up over the 600 cap for um Yeah, I'm just kind of waiting for, for it to fill up now. <laughs> did you unpause it? Yeah. Mhm. Oh yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah. All right, everyone's going to become normal workers now. Uh, <laughs> come on. I guess eventually they'll... At least they're useful, right? Like, they don't have a population yeah. cap. Yeah, okay. But they they never uh, cross jobs, do they? Once they're a thing, they are a thing until they Workers die. Can do any, 
workers can do the factories. They're the only ones that can do the factories, and they can also forage, okay. and they can also build. So they're, they're like the general purpose bees, so that's less of a blow I get <laughs> than, um, yeah. than the other stuff. So it's it's also it's a random portion of your um, population above a certain threshold, so I think it's like two-thirds. I get you. Okay. Well, good. That's less severe than... Suddenly yeah, of, of all those things, it's probably the least disruptive. So did the uh, did the caterpillar come back a third time? It did. Yeah, as uh, as the butterfly. As, uh, oh, right, sweet. I, I wasn't sure if you'd gotten that yet, and I was like, get all your jelly storage up because mm. it like, maxes out your jelly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that happened around the time we were fiddling with Discord because it was kind of. Oh, right, right. on itself for a little bit. Well, this is good. I mean, we haven't had any crashes. Um, you know, the game has been holding up fairly well. <laughs> yeah, nothing Aside is... from the tutorials not playing. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, that's why you're here, right? You tell me what to do. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's that's another thing. So everyone turned into to workers, or, or two thirds of your population turned into workers, which means that you have significantly fewer um, mm -hmm. bee sitters. Yeah, and now they're not coming in so, nearly as uh, yeah. as frequently here. Just trying to rebalance that until that recovers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're definitely on the way. Yeah. Damn, plenty of space. Unless old body hits and like destroys all your jelly. Hey, storage. come on! Don't be calling old body into this. <laughs> oh, that's actually a good point. Because if he does hit there, that's a bad. You probably time. do want some redundancy. Yeah. Mm. Your uh, B sit is creeping up there. No one else does. No, that's fine. That's fine. It's, I, I mean, if you can't <laughs> laugh at your own jokes, they they must be extremely bad. Yeah, I want I want all the kind of bee puns and stuff to feel like the kind of groaners in uh, in this <laughs> at least. That's in, in my mind. That's that's how they should come across. I don't know. I think my favorite so far are all the the stink bug ones. Can tell Mim I said that. <laughs> Speaking of, uh, she's making an unimpressed face. I love it. <laughs> she says that we're conspiring against her. So uh, <laughs> good. Sorry, Mim. <laughs> he does say sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Alright, so what I think I'm going to do then is get up to the 600 mark, and then... And then you can make a new bee. Then I can make a new queen, and then we'll probably call it good for tonight. Yeah, yeah. It's my goodness, it's been all two hours already. <laughs> the heck yeah, happened at like, the time? This is something I found as well, is like, you know, I sent a, I brought on a bunch of testers. It seems like... Um, all, all the people that I test do testing with in person, I'll sit down and I'll go, hey, I, I added a new menu or I added a added some little thing, and five minutes later I'm like, you've seen everything that there is to see in this build, and they will sit there and continue to play out <laughs> the remaining two hours. <laughs> and I'm like, if it's hard to get up and walk away from, then then there's something something there, I think. Yeah, I mean that's certainly a good sign. Oh, was that carpenter bees helping? Uh, that was, uh, some dodgy grasshopper dude. Oh, yeah, yeah. I figured we're close. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. So you click on the throne now and... Yeah, uh, so now what's what's gonna happen? Is my old queen just gonna disappear and get replaced by the new one? Well, that depends. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, that's nice. Uh, huh. 
if you make a new hive, then the um, you know everything basically new game. But That's if you stay in the same hive, safe. then uh, I get you. Then well, the old queen will hang around. I want to pitch away my work, so let's uh, go in here. There you go. She's just bumbling around the throne room now. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> so the queen gets bigger as she gets older. Which, oh, um, I see. Yeah, it's I, about I, to I say, did. suddenly this uh, throne seems huge. Yeah. Oh, very cool. I'm at the population cap again. Alright, well, well, very good. So yeah, I felt like I felt like as far as end goals go, that it makes sense to have a goal that is, do I want to keep playing or not? You know, like if you want to keep playing, then you engage with the game. If you don't want to keep playing, then it doesn't matter if you don't. Sure, 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 sure. I thought I remember. Seeing... Yeah, I had a lot of people asking about end goals. Like they're going, oh, you know, what what's the purpose? What's the end goal? And I'm like, well, it's it's kind of like SimCity, where just finding a sustainable existence is is sort of the, the thing and responding to. Events that happen is, is the. Oh, your honey's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Trapped again. Oh, no, I'm almost uh, six of the way up on jelly now. So the, the old queen will stick around for as long as uh, she's alive. Her huh? lifespan, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Activity bumbling. Yeah, I get you. Yeah, bumbling is their. Um, their whenever they're picking a random place to go to, if they don't have a specific goal, then it's bumbling. <laughs> bumbling. Which it feels appropriate. That's, uh, yeah, that's definitely accurate. Cool. I, I like that it looks so smooth regardless of zoom. Yeah, cheers. I dig the, um, I like the depth of field. Like, I think that's really interesting. Um, it doesn't, like, depth of field just doesn't make sense with a, an orthographic camera, which this is. Right. Um, I think if, if an orthographic camera could exist in real life, it would probably have infinite focal length, so depth of field wouldn't, wouldn't exist. But, um, but uh, but it, it gives like the sense of scale that I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. Look at them all go. Okay. But, it's... but yeah, it's it's a hard game to put down, I think, or, or at least when I play it, I find it to be a hard game to put down. And I'm always like, oh, I could just just go a little bit longer. I could just just do this other thing, and and before you know it, like. <laughs> you're making another queen, or you're doing another hive, right? Or, right. Or you're building up to the edge of the map to see how far away that. Okay, I think I saw some mention of an auto save somewhere. Is that right? If I back mm -hmm. out of this, it'll be ah, very good. Okay, you can do a menu a manual save as well. Uh, let's see if, that if you want, but it should have an auto save every ten minutes. Uh, sure. Ah, nice. Hexagonal. Five and a quarter inch. Oh, three, yep. No, three and a half inch, I would. Oh, five and a quarter. It's got the little second. The little center section there. I love it. Little discs. I was like, <laughs> you know, just, just quickly snap something together. It used to That used to just be a surprise mark, and I was like, nah, I can do better than that. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a, lot of, a lot of room for uh, the placeholder graphics in there at the moment to be replaced, but um, it's all coming together well. I'm really happy with, with how it's progressed. Yeah, certainly. Alright, well, maybe I won't get to Honeycomb Crunch tonight. It's already getting late on my side of the world here, but I'm glad I was able to... If you do to... want to try Honeycomb Crunch, the average run is, like, less than a minute or a minute. You know, like, it's it's very, very small okay. by comparison. Yeah, maybe I'll save that for next weekend, then, for my next grab bag. Yeah, no problems. Alright, well, thanks for hanging out, Cheeseness. I really appreciate the opportunity to give this a go. It's a, it's a style you of game... Me on it. Thanks for having a go. Yeah, it's, it's a style of game that I typically don't you know, go towards just because it's not my thing, but I can I can see doing it. I can see doing it. Cheers. All right, you have a good rest of your day, man. Yeah, you too. Thanks, man. Yeah, see ya. All right. That'll do it for tonight, I think. Uh, next stream will be tomorrow night. Or not not even tomorrow night, actually. Um, tomorrow afternoon, 2 p.m. CDT, we're doing a Assault Android Cactus bingo tournament and a Campaign Plus race at the end for the winners. 
Uh, starts at 2 o'clock. I'm not sure how long that's going to go, and I'm not even sure uh, which speed gaming channel it's going to be on yet, but I'll definitely announce that once I know for sure. All right, thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.